let's get into it. Mike Cook, very exciting to have you here. Let's do a little spiel. Mike is an AI researcher and game designer based in London, UK. He works as a senior lecturer at King's College London, where he researches how AI can model and support game design processes. And he makes weird games, digital art using generative processes and creative AI. In the past, he founded Proc Jam and uh, developers game designing AI like Angelina and Puck. He's never beaten a roguelike, but he's thought really hard about what it would feel like. And uh, yeah, I always thought that you'd spoken at this conference because you're such a good match, but somehow you hadn't. So welcome. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Um, shall I kick off then? Thank you so much for that introduction. Perfect. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, Alexi's kind of given the first few slides for me. Um, but uh, my name is Mike, and I'm here to talk to you today about generating procedures, rules, and systems. Um, and uh, I also have a lot of slides following the last talk, so so we'll, we'll kick off. Um, so in my day job, I'm an AI researcher. Um, and specifically, I do research into how we can build AI systems that support or model game design or autonomously design games themselves. Um, and outside of that, yeah, I founded the Proc Jam, uh, the Procedural Generation Jam, which some of you may have entered if you're if you're part of this community, um, and uh, built systems like Angelina that designed AI, uh, that designed games. Um, and uh, when I have spare time, which these days is, is increasingly scarce, um, I like to make games and weird things as well. So I've spent over a decade, the last 13 years, building AI that design games in various forms. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. Uh, and one of the things about it is that it, it's taught me a lot about how and why people make games. Um, and I get to reflect on that and bring that back to my own process of making games. And then that feeds back into my research. Um, and really, uh, you know, don't tell anyone this, but uh, I, you know, AI research is, is a part of what I do. But what I do, I think, doesn't really have like a definition, which I think lots of us in this community actually feel like. Um, so it's that's my convenient label. Um, you know, you probably have your own labels for your work. Um, but uh, underneath AI is a lot of thinking about what it means to design games. Um, and in my spare time, I've made a lot of weird experiments, which as a result kind of are between uh, the boundaries of all of these different areas. Um, and you can find some of them on, on itch. Um, this one in the bottom right, Nothing Beside Remains, um, is a, a collaborative project with Florence Smith-Nichols, who you heard from uh, about half an hour ago, um, who is uh, doing their PhD work um, uh, on this, among other things. Um, so. The thing I want to talk to you about today is linked to some of these things. Um, but essentially, I want to start with this controversial statement, which is that I think roguelike should start using procedural generation. Um, and that might seem like an odd statement to you if you've played certain roguelikes, because um, you think, well, they already use procedural generation, of course. Like, this is brogue. You know, this is a procedurally generated level. But it's just a lot of the things in this level I've just I've just seen before, like I, I'm tired of using doors to move between rooms. Uh, you know, it's so many times, uh, every solution, there's a door in this room. You know, I use a door every day. Uh, I don't want doors anymore. I want exciting new ways to uh, engage with the world. Um, so, you know, procedural generation is okay, but we, we kind of only tend to use it for things that, uh, you know, we're comfortable using it for. I mean, you might not be comfortable using it for all of the things on this list, um, but, you know, maybe you've built a level generator in the past. Uh, maybe you've got a random item generator like in Diablo. Um, maybe you've even used it for something like puzzles. Um, and I'm not talking about chat GPT or big, you know, large language models kind of stuff here. I'm talking about like generators that you craft yourself, that you craft by hand, you know. So we're comfortable with some things, but there are other things which we're kind of less comfortable using procedural generation for, right? And today I'm going to use some of these words interchangeably. Uh, if you're a game study scholar, please at me later, much later. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, we're going to assume that all of these words mean the same thing today. Game logic, you know, anything that, that affects the way that things interact with one another in the game world, um, whatever that game might be, okay? So what would it look like if we were generating game mechanics, if we were generating game systems, if we were generating the rules of our game? Um, well, let me give you a couple of examples. Let's say you're playing a match three game um, and you swipe uh, a couple of tiles. And instead of like swapping location, um, instead the number on the tile gets subtracted. Um, so the, the, the six has a one subtracted from it, um, turns into a five. There's five in, three fives in a row now. They disappear like a standard match three. Um, and suddenly, instead of it being like a, a swapping game like in Bejeweled, it's a maths game. 
Um, or maybe let's say you were playing Beju uh, uh, Breakout, um, and uh, when the ball hits the brick, uh, the brick gets destroyed, of course, um, but something unexpected happens every time. Like every time you play Breakout, there's a new rule triggering. Um, so maybe this time uh, the ball gets bigger every time it destroys a block, so that uh, the level actually gets easier the more you play it, because it's easier to get those like last blocks because the ball is now massive. Um, so what would it be like to kind of play games where you don't know what's going to happen when you're interacting with, with the game, right? So at this point, you might be thinking, hmm, 25 minutes of this, huh? Maybe I'll just take the social break a little bit early. Um, you know, or you might be thinking like, well, what, like how you can't do that. That's not how game design works, right? I, I don't, how am I going to know what these generated rules do? How am, it's going to break my game design? What do you even mean generate a rule anyway? You just, you know, you're giving these extremely badly constructed PowerPoint animations. Um, what are you talking about? Well, I don't have time to answer most of these questions, but we're going to sort of gently gloss over them in a very academic way um, and hopefully entertain you. Um, you might also be thinking like, I don't want to randomize my game design. Like, I like designing games. Roguelikes are procedural enough already. I can't, you know, this is the one thing you haven't taken from me. I can't procedurally generate the core as well. Um, so what I want to start off by is talking to you about this idea, which is that game design is generative design. Um, and I've got a paper about this that I'm hoping to publish next year. Um, but the gist of it is that all of us are generative designers, whether or not we're building procedural generators. And I should warn you now that uh, this is a great time to go and put the kettle on and make a cup of tea if you don't want me to go off on a huge tangent. Um, but I think it will be worth it for, for those of you that are into it. So what do I mean when I say game design is generative design? Well, um, you know, you might have heard this quote before. Don't remember exactly who said it. Uh, probably Oscar Wilde. Game is a series of interesting decisions. Again, lots of reasons why people don't like this quote, but the reason why I'm going to bring it to you today is that a game isn't a series of anything. A game is a space. A game is a big wide space. It's not like a, a linear path that we walk along. It's, it's mind-bogglingly huge um, as a space. And I don't think we appreciate how wild these spaces are sometimes, right? So um, in AI, we talk about action spaces quite often. So if you're building a, an AI that wants to play a game, um, we think about like what is every decision, every action that the, the AI could take right now. So if you look at uh, this uh, fake rogue like I've got on the right hand side here, um, the action space includes uh, like moving in every cardinal direction. Um, it could involve uh, casting a fireball at the skeleton. Um, it, it involves casting a fireball at like a load of other places as well. Like we may not think of those as actions because they're not very useful, but, but they are actions. And as game designers, we can shape that action space. So we can add objects in that change the options available to the player. So maybe if I put a campfire in between, uh, the player can't move east anymore. I've removed that option from the action space. Um, and we can also modify uh, people's decisions um, as well. So by putting the campfire there, maybe I make casting a fireball more attractive because it's going to enhance the fireball. So as game designers, we're always thinking about these ways that we can change the way that our players behave. Um, and you can imagine this as like a big network, a big network of possibilities where the player takes an action, they decide what to do. Maybe they decide to move next to the skeleton for some reason. Um, and then our game responds. And some of the response is very predictable. Um, some of it's probabilistic, like your skeleton might have a number of different things that it does, and maybe it rolls some dice when it decides what it wants to do. Um, but we're constantly exploring this massive web of possibilities. So uh, one way of thinking about this is that it's kind of like this loop, right? We've got um, these systems at the top, uh, and they define the kinds of actions the player can take. The actions available inform the player's decision making, um, and then they make an action which affects the systems and the rules again. And as game designers, we often talk as if we have control over the action space. We might say, like, I've added fireballs in to my game, and the player can cast fireballs now. But actually, we're controlling the systems and rules. We're not controlling the action space. You can't imagine every single possible situation in which the player can cast a fireball. That's why all these edge cases appear. It's why glitches appear. It's why these games are so surprising. We're controlling the systems. And that's important because that's true of every game designer, no matter what kind of game they design, even if you design puzzle games. Um, in the next session, uh, we'll be hearing about hand-designed Sudoku, which I'm really excited to hear about. And even a Sudoku is a, a space of experiences, right? It's not the case that every number can be in every one of these squares. Um, as the player solves this Sudoku, the, the landscape of the areas they can look at will change. There will be more or less information in different areas. Like Sudokus have pacing, they have a difficulty curve. 
if the designer may not always think about this, but it is there, it's always there. We're always building a space of possibilities. So if I think about like generating rules that are going to reshape the player's uh, space of actions, you know, is that really that much different to writing a generator that reshapes the navigable space, the physical space of the world? And actually roguelikes have examples of cases where we have kind of procedurally generated rules, um, except they, they don't last very long. So unidentified potions, you know, if you play enough of a roguelike, you will learn what all the potions do. You may not know which one's which, but you will develop a technique for, for detecting them. So what I'm kind of suggesting here is that we take the potions idea and we kind of supercharge it with some new techniques so that the potions are always fresh, they're always unexpected, they're always surprising. So how do we do that? Well, today I want to uh, give you just kind of three ideas and three possibilities, uh, and they kind of escalate in risk, <laughs> but they also escalate in reward as well. They get kind of spicier and more exciting as, as it goes on. Um, but I wanted to start off with something kind of accessible and, and sort of sensible so that you feel that you go away from this talk today and yeah, I could go and do that. So let's talk about rearranging content first. So this is a screenshot from Invisible Ink, uh, one of the best games ever made, I think. Um, and uh, at the start of a campaign, you can turn on or off all sorts of settings within the game. Uh, and there was one setting in particular that I just turned off every campaign. I just decided I didn't want this every single campaign, and I loved the rest of that game. Um, so we often actually build our games to be quite modular. Um, and this allows us to build generative systems that turn on and off various things um, and just kind of shuffle around some options that already exist and create variants, create campaign variants, create level variants. And a kind of related example of this is Slay the Spire's daily challenge. So Slay the Spire um, is a deck builder. It has this daily challenge where it adds modifiers to the game. So the modifiers are pulled from, I think, about a set of maybe 20 modifiers in total. Um, it chooses two or three every day. And sometimes they have a compounding effect. So if you have the green card modifier, uh, in this case, uh, that means that this blue hero can also find green cards. Um, and the specialized modifier says that you start with five copies of a random card which means that on this daily challenge, you could, there is a chance that you could start with five copies of a green card. So those two things combine together and that creates some really interesting challenges sometimes. The difficulty with Slay the Spire's daily challenge is that it's not necessarily communicated super well to the players and players have a certain expectation coming into the game because of how the main game is. This is kind of a side game. Um, and so when I, I was looking for an example of this online and I wanted to talk about Certain Future, which is a modifier that removes all decisions from the overworld map. Um, and instead of finding a screenshot of what that looks like, I found this meme that someone had made, which summarizes the entire point I wanted to make, which is that lots of players will check the daily, uh, the daily challenge. And if they see this modifier, they just won't play it. Um, and so, you know, in this case, players aren't prepared to experience this. And we're going to talk a little bit before the end of this talk about kind of how you prepare players um, for this experience, how you make sure that they don't have this reaction uh, when they see that modifier. So the second technique uh, that you can use is custom design languages. So when we're rearranging existing content, we are literally just turning on and off things that are already in our game. Um, but we can also build special languages that let us uh, describe things in our game uh, in a different form. And actually, some games have this built into them. So Noita uh, here from uh, Nola Games um, has a, a wand programming system where you can slot modules into wands and they'll get executed one after another. Um, and that includes things like modifiers as well. And that means that you can build wands that do kind of unusual things. Some people describe it as programming ones. Um, and in the bottom right here, we have Baba is You, um, which is a game where you push objects around the world to make sentences. And those sentences are also embedded as real rules in the game's logic. So both of these are examples of playable languages that allow the player to modify uh, some aspect of the game's systems or rules. But we don't just give them to the players. Uh, it's actually very common for us to build these tools for other people as well. Uh, and those people are modders. So this is an excerpt from a mod for Caves of Cud. Um, and even if you've never played Caves of Cud before, if you look at some of these lines, um, you can guess what this is describing, right? This line here, the second line I've highlighted, um, says that there's something called hit points of value 100. So we kind of, we can guess what that is, even if we've never played this game before. Ele electric resistance, value minus 50, like we kind of know what that means. So we already build these special design languages for other things to use, except those things are people and not AI systems. 
um, which is great because we could randomly generate one of these right now. We could we could go home in the uh, in the social break after this and write a caves of card monster generator, um, and it might break, um, but it, it might it might produce something really interesting. Just as a brief aside here, one of the, the, the challenges with designing a design language is that something that I call the puzzle script effect, which is that um, the things that tend to become most memorable about the use of that language or that tool are the things that push at the edges of it, that kind of push the limits of what that tool could do, which is can be really exciting, can be really good. Um, but when you come to kind of think of that tool, you often think about the most complicated things built with it, whereas that is not necessarily what the tool was designed to do. And that's not so much a problem with humans, but it does become a problem when you're using AI, because AI won't necessarily be able to use, for example, puzzle script in a really complex way. Um, they'll be using more of the kind of center uh, intended use of it. Um, and I could talk for like at least two hours about designing design languages for AI to use. Um, I've done a lot of it. Um, and there's lots of things that you have to think about. You have to think about things like, how easy is it to write a statement that's illegal? So when I told you just now that Caves of Cud, that mod has hit points uh, and that has 100 hit points, probably none of you thought, what if I give it negative hit points? Like none of us, that did not enter any of our minds. Um, but if we tell a generative system, oh, uh, this hit points thing, just put a number in there. Um, that, depending on how we code that, that might give a number between minus infinity and plus infinity. Uh, it might give a floating point number. Um, it could do all sorts of things that we might not have thought to be clear about. And that could result in interesting glitches or it could crash our game. Um, so we have to think about like how, what kind of common sense am I not including here? Because when you release modding tools, you know, the, the players are going to play around with that and learn what the limits are. Um, but your procedural generator doesn't. If we just have a text generator, it may not know, you know, we, we may not have told it this common sense stuff that we expect it to know. So I think custom design languages are really good um, because they're a nice trade-off between you know, allowing some expressivity, allowing us to, to, to talk about things um, in a very focused way. You can design a design language for a particular domain, like spells or potions, um, and then you don't have to worry about the whole world of generative possibilities. You can kind of constrain it a little bit. Um, so uh, if you look up some of my talks about Puck or Angelina, um, you'll see that I've used design languages to help these systems uh, describe games and define their rules. Um, and I, I think it's a really great approach to use. But we could take it one step further. We could get even spicier. Um, it's, uh, it's getting late here, you know, I'm getting tired, you know, let's, let's just throw caution to the wind and generate code directly, right? Because if you think about the most popular language that humans use for writing game mechanics, um, it's program code, right? Most of us probably write some form of program code um, or maybe have some experience of it if we've ever written uh, a game mechanic uh, into us, into our games. And the thing with code is that code is just text. You know, we know how to generate text. There's generative text in the chat system for the roguelike celebration. There's generative text in loads of roguelikes that you've played. Um, if you want, you can get Unity C Sharp to compile text into uh, an assembly and load it at runtime back into the game that compiled it. Um, should you do that? Look, who am I? Who am I to tell you whether you should do that or not? Um, I've done it. It was a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's important to remember that uh, we can generate anything that we want, right? Like we don't have to, you know, there's nothing special about code, right? If we want to generate some code and compile it at runtime and throw it into our game, why not? Um, I mean, I'll tell you why not later probably, but um, I mean, a reasonable question is why would you want to do that? Um, so the thing with domain specific languages, which is the stuff we were looking at before, the design languages, um, is that they're generally less expressive than our actual game code. Uh, and that's intentional. We want them to be less expressive. The reason why we build modding tools is because it's an easier way for people to create content for our games, right? Um, but it still is less expressive. So that might mean that it surprises us less, the kinds of things that a system can do with it. Um, and implementing these design languages takes a lot of effort. You know, if you change something in your game so that Actually, now, if you give us negative hit points, it will actually crash the game and delete everyone's user data. Um, now you've got to remember, oh, God, I need to make sure that the AI doesn't generate that anymore. And, you know, you, there's so many things to remember, so much extra work, um, whereas you're already writing code, right? So if, if you're already writing code, then if you change your code, the stuff that your code generator uses also changes. Like, it, it, it's sort of already linked to, to your creative process. Now, if you're thinking that um, <laughs> making roguelikes is stressful enough, I, I don't want to do that. Um, well, I'm working on a tool. I'm working on a tool um, called Pixie, 
which attaches to C sharp code. Um, at the moment, it's it's in Unity, but there's nothing Unity specific about it. Um, so I'll be looking into getting it into things like Godot soon as well, hopefully. Um, and it can generate bits of code. So you kind of take it on a tour of your code base, and you're like, here's the acceleration variable. You're allowed to use that. And then at the end of the tour, uh, you show it to an empty code block, and you say, I'd like you to generate me some code that goes here. Um, and you can give it a bit of guidance maybe as well. Um, and Pixie generated the breakout example earlier where uh, when you when you get the ball to bounce off a brick, the ball gets bigger. Um, I asked it to generate a game that would make it easier to play, um, a generate a game mechanic. And I want to be clear, just to be just to be clear about this, this is not a, a GitHub Copilot situation. Uh, Pixie only knows about your code base. Um, so you are guiding it, you're in control. That's why we have these little uh, attributes in square brackets so that you can say, okay, touch this data, please don't touch this data, you know, and it, it will always uh, do what you tell it to, uh, mostly. Um, and if you were interested in some of the, the theoretical uh, background behind this, um, I recorded a YouTube video uh, uh, about the kind of inspiration for this um, back in 2020 as well. So those are kind of three approaches, three ways of thinking about generating game mechanics, right? Um, but before I close, I wanted to talk about, well, how can we actually like keep this under control? Because, you know, I, I'm, I'm an academic, right? So I can spend my day job making broken things. No one will ever ask me to fix it. Uh, but I promise you, I have actually found some strategies for kind of making this work, making this sensible. So the first solution is to solve it in the design phase, right? So if we accept that our game is going to produce broken rules, broken systems, then we can actually design the game around that with that in mind. So in really bad chess, for example, it randomly generates chess boards and it knows that some of these chess boards will be unfair. So it gives the player different amounts of score based on whether they win or lose a board and they teach the player not to expect to win every board. And this kind of links to the notion of streaks in roguelikes, which is you know, something that's come out more and more in past years, where it's not about the performance in a single run, it's about consistent performance across many runs. So the player does not expect to win all the time. You know, Winning a single run is not what's important. What's important is understanding uh, the, the ability over many runs. And when I was writing these slides, it made me think of uh, Stephen Flavall, also known as Jorbs on YouTube, very good Slay the Spire player, ex-Poker Pro, and he's got this wonderful talk where he talks about the two types of players, optimal and nemesis. And he says, when I make these plays that I think are right, and often they are right, sometimes they're still wrong, I still lose most of the time. So he's saying that he doesn't care about winning every game of Slay the Spire. What he cares about is playing the best he can in the conditions he's been given. And that's the kind of mindset that we have to get our players into if we want to generate you know, systems that we don't know whether they work or not. Um, Stephen's an incredible thinker and, and lecturer. He's got a book, by the way, called Before We Go Live, which I highly recommend. Um, I'll post a link on the obelisk later. Um, and I had another thing that I, I wanted to talk about because just last week, I found this game called Mosolina. Um, here's a, an excerpt from the Steam page. It's literally impossible for me to check if all levels are beatable with all combinations of tools because I've never seen them before. Um, this is a game about randomly giving players tools, randomly giving them a level, and just seeing if they can solve it. And this is a game which sets the player up to expect that. So designing around it is the best solution, I think. But there are other solutions. So another option is that we can solve it in development time. So Elite has galaxy generation in it, but they only released five galaxies in the game for various reasons. Um, so as a designer, you can decide what procedural content goes into your game. Maybe you spend half an hour a month with a cup of coffee, looking at some generated ideas for new items, uh, and you pick one to go in the next patch or update. It doesn't have to be something that lives in your game. You know, systems are quite impactful, so it makes sense that you might want to release them you know, manually. Or, if you're feeling spicy, you can try and solve it live. So in AI, we have this paradigm called generate and test, where if you don't know how to make something good, but you know how to recognize something good, you can just generate loads of stuff, and eventually you'll find something that trips your good sensor. Um, so what you can do, what uh, I use in some of my systems like Pixie, is to build these unwinnable scenarios. So here, I know this player is going to die on the next turn. Six skeletons are going to hit them. So we generate an item, give it to the player, get them to use it on themselves, and then play the next turn out. And we can do this hundreds of times until we find an item that allows them to survive the next turn. And we don't necessarily care what that item does, we just know that it's interesting at that point. So generating uh, tests that can allow you to investigate these questions of what your generated mechanics can do um, is really interesting, is a really interesting approach too. Okay. 
I'm going to close up. Before I close, there's just uh, one kind of thought I wanted to leave you with, which is that um, there is a reason why doors are good, and that's because I go through them every day, so I understand how they work. Okay. So the problem is, if you generate loads of mechanics, you don't actually know what to tell the player this thing is, right? Um, so the one final tip I wanted to leave is that, just like any other generated content, you often need a theme that tells the story of the generated content, right? So for systems, that's why potions work so well. It could be spells or ancient languages, um, it could be experimental technology. Find a theme that works for the fact that the player doesn't know what's going to happen when they push this button, basically. Um, or throw caution to the wind and don't worry too much about the theme and, and just live your life. Um, but I know that theme is very important to lots of us in this community. So before I close up for questions, um, I just wanted to leave with one last slide, uh, which is that I've been working in AI and procedural generation for a long time, uh, almost 14 years. Um, Proc Jam's almost a decade old. Um, I now have uh, a permanent job at a university in, in London um, that I'm very, very happy about. Uh, and I have wonderful students, a wonderful group. Um, I have so many amazing things, um, and a lot of it is because of people I met in the indie games community and the generative systems community, many of whom are here today, I think. Um, and I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, and I just wanted to kind of thank you all. You know, I, I kept meaning to submit talks to this place, and, and I finally am here, and it's, it feels really lovely to talk to you all. So it's a real privilege to be part of this community, such a, a kind and understanding one. You know, you walk around the, this space that's been designed, and you just feel the warmth of this space. Um, and I really hope that there's many decades ahead of doing weird things together. Uh, we all kind of float between these sort of strange job titles and we're all in and out of industry and academia and we don't know where we're going. Um, but it's wonderful when we get to come together like this and just remember like what actually matters. So thank you all so much for all of the support you've shown me over the last 10 years because um, I wouldn't be here without you. Um, and on that note, speaking of people that uh, I wouldn't be here without, uh, please do check out these students and colleagues of mine um, who do wonderful work too. And if you want to talk to me now or 15 years from now, um, just drop me a line. Probably not on Twitter 15 years from now, but uh, certainly at that email address. Um, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Oh, you hit me with emotions right at the end. I got an MC, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I mean, the same. Like, my career would not be what it is without this conference. Absolutely. So. Oh, thank you. And it, it is, I mean, it's like, I, I help run it now because it meant so much to me, but it's also like, it works because it's speakers. So thank you for, for the time to put together such a talk. I can't believe you, it was like such a spicy talk and I love it. So full of hot takes. And then like, you get the fighty energy in the last minute, like got punch. Bring <laughs> everyone back in at the end. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Oh. Well, thank you. Uh, we have a little bit of time for questions. The current top voted question, is tell me more about Rubber Santa. <laughs> so I cut this example out from the beginning. Uh, it was the third example I had of a generated mechanic. Back in 2012, the first experiments I did with mechanic generation, I wanted to put them in a game. And it was coming up to Christmas. So I thought, well, I'll make a Christmas game. But I forgot it was generating random mechanics. So you know, one of the mechanics was that it just made the player really bouncy. So you know, Santa was like pinging off the walls and like, <laughs> kicking up snow everywhere. And I was like, well, it's going to be out for Christmas. I don't have any time to think about this now, you know. So, uh, so yeah. Sometimes you can just make a game about Rubber Santa, and it's fine. Um, so don't worry too much about theme. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Wonderful. Um, one less goofy question uh, from Sana. Um, what are some ideas to make the code generator more versatile than a design language approach? I think. Um, it's it's quite challenging. What I really want to do next year, hopefully, is actually share like what what my code generator looks like, um, because some things you can give it sort of way too much variation. So actually, you know, do you want to let it choose any number when it when it's when it's applying it to a variable, right? Probably not. Like lots of numbers have a sensible range. So you know, Pixie allows you to tell it like don't don't go outside this range. I don't think anything interesting is out there. You know. Um, but at the same time, you want to give it that freedom. So like letting it call, letting it call functions in your code that maybe you don't think are useful. Like sometimes that's interesting. Like, you know, don't don't just restrict yourself to the things that you think are going to lead to good game mechanics. Because most of the really cool stuff that have come out of these systems for me are always like the most bonkers things it's changed. Like I've forgotten to tell it not to do something and it's just run with it. Um, right. So, yeah. Wonderful. I think that, that's a good a good bit of advice to, to end on. So thank you so much. Thank you for staying up late, I assume. Yeah, it's not too bad. <laughs> uh, yeah, excellent. Uh, thank you.